First of all, thank you for sharing these results, interesting results in, for this landmark trial. I suppose that when you start the trial, uh, you expect more differences between the groups in terms especially on secondary and endpoints, mm -hmm. as me. So I try to understand why uh, you do not have difference between groups. Because you, you explain your diets, but your diet, I, I cannot understand the diets that you recommend because you are, uh, you, uh, I have seen the differences between the amount of proteins, also in terms of glycemic index, in terms of the amount of fat, but I think that there are other things in the diet, other uh, food or, or other nutrients that are more interesting and that determine the results that you expect. For example, the type of fat. For example, the type of carbohydrates. The sources of carbohydrates. The animal protein, vegetable protein, the phytochemicals. So, at the end we are eating food. So, I cannot understand the differences between the groups. In, in case of the, 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 high, the, 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 the diet that is rich in protein, is animal protein, vegetable protein? Diogenes that uh, two thirds were animal protein and one third were vegetable protein almost everywhere in any diet group, but we don't know what it is in preview yet. Um, we, de we see some diet differences, but we don't see any difference in our outcomes. Why? Maybe the differences in the dietary intake were too small to produce a difference in our metabolic outcome. Maybe the weight loss and the fact that they were all keeping a healthy diet, healthy exercise regime, weight down, etc. was enough and therefore the diff small differences in the dietary pattern don't matter. That's a very interesting question also for this group, I think. What really matters mm -hmm. if you keep your weight down and a healthy lifestyle in general? So, um, I would like to hear the opinion of anyone else on this too. But you also made the point that they were also on a healthy diet, mm -hmm. both groups. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if diet is not important. Mm -hmm. It's in combination, all those things are important. So Let's not shortchange ourselves. Exactly, but in this scenario, apparently the amount or the type, uh, the amount of the type of protein, I'm sorry, the amount of protein and type of carbohydrate did not matter. And also, it's quite difficult really to make the differences we wanted in protein intake, for instance. 10 energy percent difference in protein intake is almost impossible, it turns out. Not for only from our project, but for also from others. So I really like the presentation by Germain and uh, focusing also on sustainability. So uh, we did another small project where we saw that 15 energy percent protein from vegetable sources produced the same sati sati satiety than 25 percent energy from animal protein sources. Small study, but still there is something there. Okay. Um, David. If I can just chime uh, in here a little bit. Um, we've done a study which had a very similar report. And I meant to take it to the last meeting we had, and I meant to take it to this meeting. It's, a, it's a, an intensive study, a small study, only 160 people or so, randomised to a <coughs> low calcium effect, or basically a high fibre diet. And our, our picture looks the same when we look at the diet. We've got this wonderful reduction that goes on for three years with a low glycemic index diet. And the, 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 the higher glycemic index diet is the same. They're parallel lines. So we thought this is crazy because what we got was a quite different picture. We got a, a big fall in hemoglobin A1C over the first six months. And then it gradually went up uh, to one year when they, they started becoming the same thing. And this was crazy, because the glycemic index seemed to be the same, kept was constant. So, <coughs> a lot of thinking about this. 
And one of the things we did was we, we looked at, they also had a, a weight change. The, uh, the little person we can accept had a somewhat of a weight change, which was constant. So we, we, what we did is we looked at the, the anticipated weight loss that we got from the diet, the diet records. In other words, so if they were having a weight loss, you assume the calories would go down. If they had some of weight gain, you assume the calories would go up because we had three monthly measurements. And what we found was that um, as, as we went further on with the diet, the relationship between what they said they were eating and what their weight change was was blown apart. It was good at the beginning. I mean, it looked like the, what we might be seeing is just people were recording well, they were true up to about six months, or nine months, and then afterwards, they didn't care. I mean, they just said it was a low blessing the beginning of and that's what we, we, we analysed it as. But it wasn't. And we tried the metric of, well, let's not bother about how, how, how low they say they went, but how consistent their records were. And we looked at consistency, and then we saw that if we just took out the consistent people, they were the ones that showed a difference, perhaps going up to two, two and a half years. But even they wavered after that. So I do think that there's something very strange about the way people write their diets over a long period of time. Very true, very true, I agree. We, we just had these data, so we clearly need to do more of these uh, yeah, digestion analysis. Um, but we have protein from uh, urea or, or nitrogen in urine. And it shows the same pattern in the beginning, big difference, and then it goes more and more towards each other at the end of the three years. So, and we don't see exactly the same for protein with the dietary record, so you're completely right. The biomarkers. Yeah, it's a biomarker. <laughs> Thanks. Um, also for the previous study, thank you very much. I think that's very interesting data. And it's a spectacular result. You actually show that losing 10 kilograms of weight will prevent pre-diabetes. Oh. Right? Or you, it, it will stop people from going into diabetes because you were much better than any other trial did before. So this effect of losing weight does have quite a sustained effect. And you have this amazing result, which we also saw in the Optifit trial, for instance, that people have a maintenance of better blood sugar and lower insulin levels, even if you don't understand that entirely. Going back, I, th I fully agree with what David said. And in the Diogenes trial, you people were so wise to stop it after six months. If you look at the six months data for, uh, for effects on, on metabolic parameters or so, no. Okay. Can I ask a second question to, uh, to Dr. Rosquist? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> it's <up to> yeah. <laughs> I, Frederick. Yeah. Frederick, I, um, I really liked your talk. We, we have been working with galactose because some people give galactose to maintain brain function. Actually, one of the professors in Berlin, and we did a study with him, um, uh, with Dr. Kabisch here. Uh, and the one thing which is remarkable is if you take lactose-free products, they simply cleave the galactose and the glucose. If you have free galactose, it's resorbed much more proximally, actually by, by uh, uh, GLUT4, I think, and it causes a massive release of GIP. So if you look at people who have just, uh, uh, who have uh, lactose-free products, you wonder if they wouldn't have more harm because they have free sugars in there, glucose, and they have a very high glycemic index. Lactose, I believe, has a fairly low glycemic index. So and so you, you might see differences much better for galactose in such products. And also you come up with the idea that this might be harmful. Uh, I think that based on the available evidence we have now, we cannot say very much on that. And I haven't looked at it from that perspective. Okay, Ellen, please. <clears throat> yes. Uh, uh, going back then to the, the previous questions on the preview uh, trial, I was just wondering, uh, looking at the, uh, you, uh, and you made a comparison uh, with, uh, with the uh, previous uh, lifestyle intervention trials, and you say the risk of, re or the chance of remaining free of diabetes is 90, 60 per, uh, percent, so that's indeed very high. <clears throat> but the question is, yeah, can you really compare it to those trials, of course, because 
And there you see a, a reduced diabetes incidence of 50% with, with, with a very small uh, weight loss. So it's really the, the lifestyle change. And uh, you have impressive results with respect, of course, the weight loss that at least uh, uh, almost 40% of the people are not pre-diabetic pre uh, uh, anymore. So I was just wondering, had you expected something different when you did not have the weight loss period in before, when you just would have lifestyle intervention with advices? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because, yeah. of course, with respect to weight maintenance, this may be a good design, but with respect to lifestyle change, would, had you ex would you expect something different without the weight loss? Very good question. Yes, we expect the differences. Uh, based on what we knew from before, yes. But we didn't anticipate this weight loss to have such a huge impact on everything uh, that we wanted to measure. Uh, so we didn't see any difference in anything anymore. Um, we did expect to see a difference from the beginning, that's why we did the study, yeah. But we wanted to look at weight maintenance and the effects of lifestyle changes during weight maintenance because weight loss is, for many people, easy enough, but to keep it quite difficult. So that's why we made this kind of design also to resemble Diogenes, but in a pre-diabetic population. But Can yes, I we did expect to see some differences based on Diogenes and other, other studies, yes. Can I add on that? Because I thought in the Diogenes trial, there was also a phase in of a very low calorie diet, wasn't Sorry? it? In the Diogenes trial, there was also a phase in of a very low calorie diet, right? Yeah. So it was similar. Yeah. yeah, it was similar. Yeah. yeah. So that was not the difference between no. uh, these two trials. This is a, a different population. They have pre-diabetes and diogenes. They were more healthy uh, yeah. or healthy. Yes. And uh, the difference is after half a year in diogenes, it was quite small. It was not a huge difference, but it was statistically significant. Plus yes. both Thanks. exercise, right? Both and there were no exercise yeah. in diogenes, yeah. But it, uh, do you not consider the lifestyle mm -hmm. intervention successful in your trial? Yes. I, no, I, and I think that seems to be missed to some extent. Yeah. Because but everybody's talking about weight loss and the wonderful thing of weight loss, and then the lifestyle intervention didn't do anything. But the way I see it, it did, it did seem to do quite a bit. It was very successful in the maintenance period. Yes, I think you're right. And we also discussed because we didn't see in the beginning we didn't almost see any incidence of type 2 diabetes and we were a little bit uh, happy for the volunteers because they didn't develop diabetes but we were also a little bit worried about our statistical power because if we don't get enough cases we'll see any differences and then what and that was uh, in fact the case we didn't yeah. see any differences we didn't see a lot of cases. I, I think we have to be careful when we have um, two healthy diets that we are then comparing because mm -hmm. our control is very healthy or we could get into the Frank Sachs situation where you control your test health, healthy <coughs> product with a very healthy control and lo and behold you get no effect. And then you, then you then say, oh, well the, the test product was not successful when in fact both were successful. You're right, but we didn't include an inactive control because we didn't find it ethical at this point because we knew that a lifestyle helps. No, and, and I, I agree, that's the proper approach to take, I think. Fred. Yeah, I just want to come back quickly to Rosquist about the galactose. I was wondering about the possible concerns, and you showed some data from injection of galactose in mice, etc. And just to put it into perspective, why would mothers synthesize galactose and lactose and feed it to the babies if there is any concern about galactose? And I just wonder, if you look to galactose intake or lactose intake in the baby, per kilogram of body weight, I think it would be much higher than what we consume with dairy. So, can, can you comment on that? Like uh, babies contra adults, uh, the, the Mikasson paper and the galactose hypothesis is based on that adults shouldn't consume too much. But as you say, in uh, like, um, uh, for babies, it actually has more beneficial roles. And in the latest uh, current issue of Journal of Nutrition, there's actually an animal study showing that if you increase the galactose content in, a, in the diet for uh, newborn mice, I think it was, you see improved um, metabolic profile later in life. So you can, I don't think you can compare at all the, the situation in early life compared to adult humans. <laughs> uh, Wendy, I'm going to ask you a question about your study. 
you didn't really see any difference in uh, liver fat. But your study was, was it, was it eight weeks, am I correct? Six weeks. Just six weeks. Do you, would you expect to see changes if it was a longer term trial? Because six weeks, and the other study you showed was eight weeks, I think. Um, no effect seen, but perhaps too short a period to see an effect. I'm not sure the duration is the main, the main factor. Um, there are some studies coming out that are showing very rapid effects on liver fat. Um, and um, I think, I think that at the time that this study was planned, there weren't that many studies looking at a dietary intervention to reduce liver fat. Um, so um, it wasn't really clear what sort of level you need or where you should start off with. So now we're starting to see maybe um, you need a certain amount of liver fat to have a perceptible shift over that period of time. Um, but I, as I understand it, I think that you can get quite rapid changes in a few weeks. But typically, I think that is with weight loss as well. Or are you talking about just a dietary change without weight loss? Yeah, I think the biggest determinant seems to be weight loss and um, whether and you can optimize it with the type of fat, which does seem to be the case from previous studies, um, or whole food, food interventions like this. And we need more information on that. Very good, thank you. Are there any other questions? Do you want to ask a question to Sure. To you? <laughs> thank you for a very nice presentation. I, I think maybe I, I may have asked something similar last year, but the last conclusion you say, uh, low calorie sweeters is not worse than water on metabolic outcomes. Could you please explain, explain why you use the word worse? Because water isn't bad, is it? I think the main conclusion is that it's no different compared to water, not worse. So that might have just been a mistake on my part in what I said. Yes. It's a matter of how you phrase it because it's typical because low calorie sweeteners are accused of being bad. And therefore you say that it's not worse than water. But it might as well be it's as good as water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Just ask. Mm -hmm. 